new article came out today, and it was covered on the Drudge Report. Fukushima radiation has reached North American shores. They point out that scientists at the Wood Hole Oceanographic Institution detected small amounts of cesium-134 and cesium-137 in samples of seawater that were taken, in this case, from Vancouver Island, British Columbia. Now, they try to assuage us each time by telling us, don't worry, these levels are very low. But understand that these levels are, that radiation is cumulative. And if radiation is in all of the seafood that you're eating, then it is accumulating each time you're eating the seafood. And we should be concerned about this because Fukushima is still not under control and because we could have this incident anywhere. Now, this is not something that is new, of course. We have pointed this out over and over again for years since this happened at Infowars.com. It isn't just that they've discovered that there is uh, uh, an ele elevated uh, level of these uh, isotopes. These same isotopes were pointed out to be present back in an article we had on April 26, 2012. Fukushima is falling apart. Are you ready for a mass extinction event? Do you think that was over the top? Well, they were talking about these same isotopes. They said maybe you've heard about sick seals, polar bears, tainted fish, mutations in dandelions, and so forth. They said that they found 40 million becquerels of radioactive iodine in seaweed. Now, they say if you don't know how much that is, they say it's quite a bit. And, of course, it is permeate, permeating and spreading throughout the Pacific Ocean. Now, of course, one of the things they mentioned in that were the sick seals. We got more verification of that in an article in January 26, 2014. University of Alaska scientists say that Fukushima radiation may be making Alaska seals sick. Again, the same isotopes. Talking about cesium-134 and 137 found in muscle tissue from control and diseased seals. They discussed the wildlife health implications from different possible routes of exposure to Fukushima fallout to the ice seals. Now, of course, we also had a story about another effect of the Fukushima radiation. In 2013, October 21st, melting starfish along the west coast prompt Fukushima concerns. In this story, they said scientists are attempting to find out why one species of starfish is literally melting in the waters off of Washington State and Canada. Strangely, the symptoms have only been seen in certain areas of Washington's Puget Sound and Canadian waters. While the verdict is still unknown, many are pointing fingers to Japan's Fukushima nuclear power plant, which has continued to leak over 300 tons of highly radioactive water into the ocean every single day. Of course, that was on the west coast of America. But this is something that permeates through the Pacific Ocean. And as we can see in this story from 2012, May 2012, Fukushima, California tuna have high levels of radioactive cesium. In this particular case, they were talking about bluefin tuna. Now, these were tuna that had migrated from the Japan coast to the California coast. So in other words, they're starting out close to where Fukushima is. They found radiation levels that were 10 times normal in these particular tuna. But then when we look at another story from June 9, 2014, we see that albacore tuna, which are not starting at Japan and migrating to the west coast of California, they're in the Pacific Ocean, not as close to Japan. Still, they're seeing a tripling in the level of radiation in albacore tuna. Again, repeating the idea that, don't worry, the radiation levels are low. But as they pointed out in the article, you can't say there's absolutely zero risk because any radiation is assumed to carry at least some small risks. And we need to understand, too, that, as I pointed out, radiation is cumulative, just as you see it accumulating in the seaweed, accumulating in the fish. It is also accumulating in our bodies. Japanese voters are heading to the polls this weekend to choose their local leaders. Nearly 1,000 elections will be held to pick governors, mayors, and assembly members. Today, we take a look at the northern prefecture of Hokkaido, the scene of a head-to-head -head race for governor between candidates from the ruling and opposition parties. NHK World's Chihiro Ijima has the story. I will take bold action based on new ways of thinking to escape the crisis caused by our declining population. Harumi Takahashi is an incumbent in the campaign. She has the recommendation of the Hokkaido chapter of the ruling Liberal Democratic Party and its coalition partner, Komeito. 
she's shaking her first straight term in office. That would be the most of any governor in Hokkaido in history. An LDP executive offered his support at the official start of the campaign season. Hokkaido is the most important district in the election. Politics is real life, three terms, 12 years of results. Harumi Takahashi is the only one we can depend on. Takahashi's campaign has enjoyed widespread support from the business community. She says she used her experience in promoting the farming sector to expand the sales of local products. By working with agricultural cooperatives, we've been playing a central role in turning dairy farms into viable companies. We must also work hard to make sure there are people who can take over the businesses. Takahashi has taken time to visit towns with declining populations. She says residents can bring about a revival by taking advantage of local resources. She is pledging to attract overseas tourists as a way of creating jobs. And she says she'll try to promote renewable energy. Takahashi's opponent in the election is Noriyuki Sato. He's supported by the Hokkaido chapter of the opposition Democratic Party of Japan. He also has the backing of the Japan Innovation Party, the Japanese Communist Party, the Social Democratic Party, and the new party Daichi. What has the Hokkaido prefectural government been doing for 12 years? Why is the prefecture in the state it's in? Sato's key pledge is to put an end to nuclear power. He is campaigning against a restart of a local nuclear plant. If Hokkaido is hit by an accident similar to the one in Fukushima, it will devastate our primary industries and our tourism sector. No more nuclear power plants in Hokkaido. Sato was joined on the campaign trail by Yukiko Kada, the former governor of Shiga Prefecture in central Japan. She also opposes nuclear energy. Sato's campaign isn't bound by political parties or organizations. His work as a newscaster has taken him to every corner of Hokkaido. He's the best choice for governor. Sato is positioning himself as an independent in an effort to rally support from undecided voters. He is alarmed by the falling number of workers in the farming industry. He says there is no effective system in place to help farmers make a profit. He is pledging to set up firms all over the prefecture to help them process and sell their produce. The campaign is the first head-to-head -head race for governor in Hokkaido in 40 years. Voters have a clear choice of deciding whether the incumbent should stay in power or whether it's time for a change. Chihiro Ijima, NHK World. Michael Ambe from NHK World joins us now with insight on the elections. Michael, what are our party leaders hoping to see? Uh, this is the first time people around the country will be heading to the polls since lower house elections in December. Uh, so members of the ruling and coalition camps uh, see it as an opportunity to make extra gains. And local assembly members play an important role in gathering voter support during general elections. Prime Minister Abe's Liberal Democratic Party and the main opposition Democratic Party are watching two governor's races in particular. Their candidates will battle it out in Hokkaido and the southern prefecture of Oita. Both camps are treating these races as opportunities to build strength ahead of upper house elections next year. LDP candidates have done pretty well in general elections since the party came back to power three years ago, but members face challenges at the local level. 
uh, during the past year. Uh, they've lost several gubernatorial elections. They're hoping to move past those defeats. They describe the upcoming local elections as the final stage of winning back power. Well, how about the DPJ? What are they looking to accomplish? Uh, well, they're also pinning their hopes on the two governor's races. In the last local elections four years ago, uh, they were the ruling bloc. And now they want to go back on the offensive. Uh, members say victory will allow them to solidify the party's foundations. Mm. And what about the voters, though? What level of interest are we seeing from them? Um, Japan first held unified local elections in 1947. For a few decades, uh, voting rates were high, even reaching 90% in some cases. But they've been steadily dropping since then. Four years ago, the figure for the gubernatorial elections was just 53%. And this time, there's no governor's race being held in Tokyo, so that drives down interest as well. Uh, but candidates are addressing many important issues, including unemployment, economic revitalization, and depopulation in rural areas. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see if these issues connect with voters. Right, Mayako, thank you very much for your analysis. Wednesday was a special day for a group of school children in Fukushima Prefecture. That's because they got to attend the opening ceremony of their brand new high school. Most of the students at the ceremony were unable to return to their old school because of the 2011 earthquake, tsunami, and nuclear disaster. Futaba Future School was built in the town of Hirono. It lies about 25 kilometers from the crippled Fukushima Daiichi nuclear plant. At the ceremony, Fukushima Governor Masao Ujibori offered words of encouragement. I am sure that all of you, as students in the new school, will become symbols of restoration. I hope you will create a better environment for Futaba in the future. There are 152 students enrolled in the school. 97 of them come from towns and cities near the nuclear plant. Many residents are still barred from returning to their homes because of evacuation orders. As one of the first students in this school, I decided to create a new school tradition that will last for 10 years or even 100 years. The school plans to cooperate with other schools in Fukushima that had to relocate. School officials say they want to work together to study ways to recover from the 2011 disaster.